Welcome to the Dirty Verdict Podcast, where your host, trial lawyer Kyle Herbert and mediator Peter Toff, break down Texas legal news, lawsuits, and verdicts. And now, here's Kyle and Peter. All right, welcome back to the Dirty Verdict Podcast. I'm Peter Taff here with Kyle Herbert. And I'm Kyle Herbert here with Peter Taff. Just couldn't be more pleased to be back here with you, Peter. Well, excellent. Uh, Kyle, we're glad to have you back. You are back just now from my home, well, half hometown, Austin, Texas, where you were watching the InfoWars trial. I was. It uh, was a crazy taco wrapped in a fajita buried in nutso sauce. It was... Um, really, really stunning, uh, to tell you the truth. And Let's just bef- as we were preparing to start today, we saw on our respective phones that um, the jury has awarded each, there are two parents, right? Right, two or two families, they awarded them each $2 million. Um, so, not exactly. Uh, this is uh, two parents of the same child uh, who was murdered, uh, the father and the mother. They're not currently married. And, um, they awarded, I believe, the mom substantially more, but the uh, verdict between the two uh, was about four point one million bucks, which, you know, I think that's actually not a terrible verdict, uh, considering that this was for actual mental anguish damages. Juries very often don't know how to handle that. Uh, I'm sure the plaintiffs are a little bit disappointed. I mean, they were they were asking for a lot more than that, seventy five million bucks per person. Um, but that is just the first step. Uh, there's going to be, this trial has been what's called bifurcated, which if you're not a lawyer, that means, uh, you get, you get two cadeds. I'm just kidding. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I was going to say. It's just got two pieces. It's got the initial, uh, initial verdict on actual damages and then a second chance for the jury to award more money, uh, in the punitive phase. And the punitive phase means the punishment phase. When you go out like to bars, do you like to use a bunch of legal terms just to show off? Are you one of those guys? No, Peter, when I go out to bars uh, to meet ladies, I normally speak in Latin exclusively. Uh, I feel like, you know, respondeat superior, sic transit gloria, that really gets the ladies on my side. And uh, so some of those are legal terms, but they don't know because they don't speak Latin. Yeah, I mean, sui generis, I think, is something that's a go-to. You know, the girls that I have dated, uh, their favorite Latin phrase is caveat emptor. Uh, True. Which makes total sense. It does, whether they know, understand it or not. Whether they whether they speak Latin or not. I actually dated a girl named Gloria once, and so sick transit Gloria made a lot of sense for her. Okay, well, good. Well, that was an aside, but let, let's let's uh, kind of frame the this trial Okay, so Sandy Hook was a um, school shooting. What twenty something children were killed by? Uh, I guess a uh, eighteen or so. Uh, yes. Young man. So I think the basic facts you've got. I think twenty school children and six adults were murdered uh, by a fella named Adam Lanza, who was apparently kind of this emotionally unstable young man who had gone to that school and one day woke up and decided to take the life of his mother. Uh, and then went to the school and, and shot it up and, and killed a bunch of innocent folks. So a similar fact pattern to the one we just heard about in um, South Texas or West Texas. In Uvalde. Yeah. Um, probably. I, I mean, I, I think the jury is still out on what exactly happened at Uvalde. But the basic facts are similar. Uh, a weapon that can fire a bunch of bullets, guy kicks his way in the door and then starts murdering people. Okay, and this trial, though, was not against the shooter or his estate or any of that. This, was, this trial was against a talk show host, um, probably with air quotes around that term, right. um, named Alex Jones and his entity. Does he, his talk show is Yeah, so right? his show was called InfoWars, and I think they're owned by a, a parent company that's called Free Speech LLC or something, some, first, something like that. And some Houston lawyers were representing two or two parents of one of the deceased children. Right. And so, what, yeah, what is it that he did that generated a lawsuit against him? Alex Jones. So they're represented by a firm here in Houston called Farah and Ball uh, and, and the, the lawyers there um, who full uh, disclosure, I know those, those guys pretty good. And I, I've actually, uh, I don't know the, 
lawyer for Alex Jones nearly as well, but I, our paths have crossed once or twice, and, and we've met. Although I wouldn't say we're friends, we're, but I have met him. Is he based in Austin? Or no, I believe he's based in Houston. I, I, my recollection is he served as a U.S. attorney, and I think his practice is he does a fair amount of white collar uh, crime, uh, criminal defense. Got it. Um, to be fair, that is, I, I apologize to him in advance if I've gotten that stuff uh, wrong, but that's that's my recollection. I looked him up when I when you told me you were going because I hadn't just tangentially followed it. So I, yeah. yeah, I think that's fair. I think he had been at you know Baker Botts or yeah. Uh, Federal clerk, U.S. attorney. I mean, obviously, very credentialed. Uh, person. A very decent pedigree for uh, for a lawyer, for sure. Okay, and so your friends were representing these two parents, uh, and what is it that Alex Jones had done or said that generated the lawsuit? Sure. Uh, so my understanding, what I've figured out from two days of trial, uh, and first of all, you got to kind of have lived under a rock for the last twenty years to not know who Alex Jones is. He's the kind of nutty talk show host in Austin. Um, who was kind of just on cable access when I started at the University of Texas. So, like, I remember him on local cable access doing all kinds of bizarre stunts, right? Um, and we can talk more about that later. But um, basically what he did is he began publishing articles and videos and sending reporters. Uh, and the basic gist of it was they kind of created and then spun a bunch of conspiracy theories um, about um, the shooting event at Sandy Hook. And those ranged from, you know, there weren't any kids that had really been killed, that they were crisis actors, um, that the parents weren't real people, um, that the uh, shooting um, was a false flag uh, designed to... Um, designed by our government to take away our weapons uh, and to stir up public sentiment uh, for gun control. Um, and he had a lot of other theories that were just as weird and, and, and maybe, to be honest, more, uglier and more hateful. Um, but he, he has a handful of yarns that he likes to spin uh, about just about everything. Um, you know, it's... It's it's the it's the it's the Gettys, it's the Rothschilds, it's the it's the Trilateral Commission, it's it's Hillary Clinton, it's the Illuminati, it's it's not real, it's not fake, you can't trust anything. Um, it's it's kind of the ugliest parts of the truther movement. And so, with regard to this particular event, you know, it didn't happen, wasn't real. Uh, the parents weren't real, the kids weren't real. Um, it wasn't really investigated. No kids died. All this kind of crazy stuff. Now. To be fair, over the years, he has come back and put a finer point on some of those opinions. But it seems as if every time he walks back a statement with some sort of clarification, he then doubles down on something else that's equally hurtful, offensive, and downright insane. Uh, and so... These parents, uh, what they allege is that because of Alex Jones's reckless defamation, um, they have suffered not just the loss of their child, but the indignity of being treated as though they are liars and crisis actors and that they've been exposed to all sorts of uh, terrible damage to their reputation and, and mental anguish for having to deal with all kinds of nutters over the years. Uh, and this this all happened about I think about ten years ago. So they, they've had a decade, nine and a half years, almost a decade of enduring this uh, stuff. All right. So obviously, there's probably a lot of people who have said silly things about them and everyone else. But he obviously um, has a following, mm. um, which leads to a lot of income. Yeah. So uh, did, was there any kind of testimony about how many people tune into his? podcast or however he transmits his uh, show or or how he drives income? So that's the interesting thing. Um, Alex Jones and InfoWars decided not to participate in any meaningful way in the litigation. And so I believe the case has been on file for four years and change. Um, and uh, over the course of that, um, they just didn't participate in discovery 
they didn't give up any documents or, or if they did, it was after years of, of seeking them. And so the court entered what were essentially death penalty sanctions, um, basically said, um, in the absence of your effort to mount a reasonable defense, we will assume that you are liable. And there's long case law on that in the state. Uh, and then I think at some point they issued a, a pretty massive sanction uh, against um, Infowars, uh, I think almost a million dollars. So in, they've already gotten a million dollars from Infowars, my understanding. It's been paid. Yeah, I believe it has. Um, but, okay. the, but the point is um, there, there should not have been, because there was not really a fight about liability, because there was no discovery, there was not a ton for the plaintiffs to latch onto. And so all kinds of numbers got thrown out during the trial that Alex Jones made $70 million in one year or $800,000 a day. And, and then Alex Jones would say, well, you know, that's none, none of that's true. I'm bankrupt. Um, and so the bottom line is Alex Jones makes an incredibly large amount of money um, based off of the silly things that he sells on his website. He sells prepper gear and, you know, dried food in a bucket that you can store underground for when the end times come. And he sells a lot of, uh, he sells an incredible amount of vitamin supplements, you know, so that you can, I'm not sure, de de defeat the globalists and the corporate media with your mind. Uh, so he sells all, he hocks all that stuff on the internet. Wasn't there at some point where he acknowledged that what he was saying about this was all, he knew it was wrong and he was just doing it to generate web traffic or fandom? You know, I don't know that he ever said that. Uh, he did say several times, and, and he says this consistently in the trial, and he, I think he says it on the television uh, or on his on his podcast. Uh, he he does, uh, I, I think anybody that's been in a relationship is familiar with the apology that goes like this. I'm sorry, uh, and I'm sorry that if what I did hurt your feelings. Uh, that's pretty much uh, his line. He will say, uh, I think this is almost a direct quote. He would say, uh, if these kids were real and if some people really died, then I'm sorry for that. I see. Uh, so it's, it's a non-apology. Uh, other times, you know, he would, I, I mean, so when you're sitting there in the hot seat about to be accused of terrible things and facing losing millions of dollars, you get, you can get contrite pretty fast and so there were moments where he would say, you know, I sure am sorry. I feel terrible. I know your child was real. I know you're real. If, if I hurt you, I feel terrible about it, and I apologize. And then 10 minutes later, he would say, you know, though I'm still sorry, you know, you know that you're being manipulated by very, very dark and powerful forces throughout the world, and you need to wake up to that. That's a crazy thing to do, mm -hmm. Right. This is testimony in court or this in yeah prior? Yeah, I mean that, so he would start out apologizing in court and then the next minute, you know, kind of a, aw shucks. I, I sure didn't mean it if you were hurt, but you and I both know the reality. And he, and he actually, there's a video out there that anybody can go look up and it's called uh, My Final Statement on Sandy Hook. And he, he, that, is, that is the perfect encapsulation of how he operates. I see. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. If you are real people, I didn't mean it. But I know a crisis actor when I see one. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just really horrible stuff. Okay. Well, shifting gears. Uh, while this case, while this trial, or right about the time, one of some entity filed for bankruptcy. Is that right? Uh, so it's my understanding that Infowars has filed for bankruptcy several times. Uh, I think they had a trial setting a couple of months back where they were set to go and Alex Jones or Infowars, one of the two, I'm not sure, filed for bankruptcy. Okay. There's no doubt that any significant judgment is gonna, he's, Alex Jones is going to drop himself and or these entities into bankruptcy. Yeah. So he said he would do that, he's done that. And he said at trial to the jury, he said, if you award any damages above $2 million, I am filing for bankruptcy. We yeah. will, we will be, well, he didn't say I'm filing for bankruptcy. He said, we can't, well, it'll be the end of my right. 
deal if any judgment over $2 million. So you, so the plaintiffs will have to get a judgment, liquidate their claim, and then go to the bankruptcy court and try to get it out of there. Is that right? And Through a reorganization or whatever. Right. Okay. And I'm, I mean, who knows what Alex Jones can do with that money. But the amount of money that he's brought in through that website appears to be inc astoundingly large. Mm -hmm. uh, if Alex Jones is to be believed, I mean, I think he said uh, at some point in the trial, it came out that in the past he had said it was his goal to do $70 million in revenue a year and that he had attained that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a significant chunk of change. Uh, but on top of that, there are two more trials stacked up. You got a punitive damages in this case, a uh, a just that segment of it. That, and then there's another jury trial in Connecticut. Exact same situation. How many people on that one? I don't know. Okay. Uh, and then I think there's another trial in Texas. Exact same situation. With your friends or different groups? Different folks. And uh, so there's going to be two more trials. Whether those get sucked into the bankruptcy court, I don't know. But you're going to have a bunch of competing claims. Uh, okay, so one of the I watched some of it online. Yep. And one thing I thought was interesting is this judge, after I think it was after every witness, once both sides had finished and said we passed the witness, then the judge would ask the jury to submit questions that they for asking for information that they didn't think was elicited in the lawyer questioning. Right. They sure did. And then so she would then say list them all out before, outside the presence of the jury and let the lawyers either she on her own say, I'm not asking that. Right. Or she, there's some, she's like, well, I'm going to do this. What do you think? And they could either object or not object or whatever. Right. Um, I saw that for, after one of the parents, did they do that for every? I believe they did that for every witness. And I've never seen that practice. Yeah. Uh, it was explained to me that several jurisdictions in Texas do that. I've never seen it. Yeah. I, yeah. So I think, um, you know, the way, cases have been tried is the same probably in most places the same as it was in the 1800s right um i mean yeah we have a little technology with some zoom and video depots and that thing but otherwise it's pretty much the same right um i do like that concept um it's to me it's interesting and what i took away and we talked about this before we came on was some of the questions reinforced to me what, I, what I've seen personally and what I tell people now as a mediator, that you have no idea what issues the jury will, will turn on. I would agree with that. And uh, as I sat there and listened to those questions, and I wasn't there for the whole trial. I was there for two days. The two days I was there, it, it was as the, I, with this caveat, it seemed like for every one question that was useful, uh, and on point and insightful about what the jury might be thinking, there was another question that was just totally irrelevant, totally out of left field, uh, or, you know, something completely ancillary to the process. Um, so, I, you know, I think if you get the right kind of judge to handle those questions, it could be really useful. Um, I don't know. Have you ever, have you, that's never happened to you in a never trial? I've never seen it. I was thinking, I'm sure jury consultants would love that. Oh, yeah. But it's kind of like with Fort Iyer, when you have ask questions. I mean, you can have two very good jury consultants and two very good trial lawyers, and a, a juror will say something, and they can take complete different takeaways. And they're probably very valid, and if they gave the reasons, they're valid. But one would say, oh, you got to keep this person. And the other would say, absolutely, you got to get rid of that person. Right. So that's the thing with those questions. There's, like, so much info that you could probably sit around with 10 excellent trial lawyer, jury consultants who would, you know, have completely different conclusions of what, what that meant. Maybe that's just one juror that's asked a question. Right. And the other 11 are like, that's stupid. I don't care about that. Right. Or maybe that's something you're like, well, we're synthesizing. There's a lot of questions in this little kind of pod. We need to retool what we're doing, focus more on damages or focus more on this aspect of liability or, you know. Right. But then maybe you're retooling your whole case based on someone who's a, an outlier. Right. Or doesn't understand what's going on. Because they're not, as the juror, I mean, you know, maybe judge instructions are not always followed, but they're not supposed to be talking about the case until they get the case, meaning close of evidence, get the charge. That's right. right. Although, I mean, this is the hard part about being a lawyer, is nobody wants me on their jury. 
<laughs> I would I would kill. I would I would pay money to go be on a civil trial jury. Yeah. Um, well, they they say don't research anything on the on the web. And you know. You, so even in a case like this, and I have no idea, right? Like I've I've never spoken to any of these jurors. I have not spoken to any of these lawyers since the case was given over to the jury yesterday afternoon. But so Alex Jones in this trial, and you might have seen this, he would show up for 20 minutes of the trial and then he would go outside and he'd give some insane rant to the media about how this judge is destroying democracy and this is a witch hunt and you know whatever nonsense he spews and then he would drive straight to his studio you know just around the corner i guess in downtown austin and put on a 20 minute episode about, you know, these jurors are blue collar. These jurors don't know what planet they're on. This judge is going to destroy America. Like, all this insanity. And, like, do we realistically think that their friends and family who know they're on jury duty aren't blowing up their texts? I mean, and that's not to say the jurors would do anything wrong, but we live in a different... So we write... The, the courts wrote these jury kind of sequestration instructions mm -hmm. in what might as well be a thousand years ago. Yeah. Right? They're, they're, those judges, the, the, the people that wrote those rules didn't have cell phones and they didn't have real-time media and they didn't have real-time blog posts and they certainly didn't have Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're right. Like the idea that these jurors aren't hearing the outside noise is has... Uh, it's it's a, it's a real interesting issue. Yeah, no, it's interesting because, as, I mean, as we said, it both popped up on our phones when the verdict came out. Well, if, so if you're a juror and you've got Twitter, it, you know, do you see something like Alex Jones testifies the judge is being unfair or whatever, and that pops up, and they, see, and they can't unsee it. But they didn't go actively go look for it, but it's just Twitter has well, an auto or CNN or whatever if you subscribe to those uh, Right, and apps. So, so that was an interesting thing that happened in the trial. Uh, there would be testimony, whatever else would happen during the court, in the court through the course of the day. And then Alex would go and give testimony about it. And in one instant, he, he, he gave some really uh, aggressive testimony about what he thought about the jurors, and it was very unflattering. Um, he gave some testimony about what he thought about the witnesses, which was terribly unflattering. Um, he put a picture up on his website of um, the face of our judge, not our judge, their judge, in flames. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I thought the plaintiffs did quite effectively was to pull that information down right off of the website. And mm -hmm. when the court reconvened, they'd say, you know, judge, we have some more questions for Mr. Jones. And, you know, are you taking this seriously? Do you think this is a game? Do you think that this jury are crisis actors? Because you've said that. Oh, no, I'd never say that. Mm -hmm. Then they'd play the video. These jurors are all crisis actors or whatever. Wow. You know, that's not a direct quote, but, mm. you know, did you put a picture up of the judge face on fire? No. Okay, well, look at this picture. Oh, I didn't. What I mean is she's trying to burn down liberty and the flames are coming out of her head or whatever crazy thing he would say. Mm. Um, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a, I've never seen a jury trial like that. Did um, is I saw something. Did his lawyer give his entire, the contents of his entire phone to the uh, plaintiff's lawyers? Um, so all I can tell you is what I heard in court. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say this with, I'll tell you the, the stuff that I have heard represented to me as fact, and then I'll, I'll give you what I think is my surmise. Um, what the plaintiffs stated in court to the judge which anybody can go listen to, um, was that 12, now 13 days ago, they were given a data drop link um, from opposing counsel, counsel for the plaintiff, pardon me, counsel for the defendants, that said, hey, here's some supplementation or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, here you go. And that the plaintiff's lawyers opened it up and they realized pretty quickly that this was not regular discovery, that it was an image of the phone, and then it contained some privileged information. I think that they went through the stuff that appeared to be emails and texts, uh, or at least the texts, 
Uh, and I, and I, and I think they represented to the court that stuff that they, uh, could obviously, sorry, let me, let me backtrack. Let me be real specific here. Yeah. You should, Cause these are, you're just repeating what was yeah. stated in open court public. Uh, right. That, that's right. But I want to make sure I get this correct. What the plaintiffs say is they were given this link. They opened it. The minute they opened it, they said, um, as soon as they started going through documents and figuring out that it had privileged communications in it and attorney notes or whatever else that every lawyer knows uh, they don't, they're not supposed to get, they, would, they, they, they stopped looking and then they sent an email back to opposing counsel and said, hey, we think you need to double check this. You might not have sent us what you were supposed to send us. These materials, uh, you know, they, these might be privileged. You know, these, these, we don't think this was sent to us on purpose. And apparently the defense lawyers sent an email back saying, disregard, we'll supplement at a later date. Got it. Um, and then I think you get 10 or 11 days to do your snap, back. your snap back, your claw back, and they didn't do anything. And then after that, it becomes fair game. And I think after that happened, they went through portions of what was produced and found documents that should have been produced uh, for example, the text messages that they used in court where essentially in a text, Alex Jones, one of his employees says, hey, this stuff we're putting out about this particular COVID related post is obviously false and we know it and you know it and we have to take it down and this is Sandy Hook all over again. Mm. And Alex Jones responded, yep, I get it, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so... That was the end of that. I mean, the, the only, the context I saw was the lawyer, plaintiff's lawyer said, did you know that your lawyers gave us your entire phone? A hundred percent. In open court. That's Damn. accurate. Yeah. That's the part I saw. So yeah, that raises, you know, 50 different issues for. Right. Lawyers. And um, well, I mean, I would say I've seen the lawyer for the defense getting skewered yeah. uh, out there for that. And, the reality is, is I hate to Monday morning quarterback anything that any lawyer does. It sure. isn't. We have incredibly difficult jobs, right. and maybe it was a mistake. Maybe it was a mistake by a staff. When you're in, when you're in that week getting ready for trial, like you might as well be on planet Mars. Right. Um, so, um, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know why it happened. I don't know how it happened. Um, it certainly made for a lot of, um, and appropriately so high drama in the courtroom. Well, it sounded like from other stories that these lawyers did not particularly like each other. I would say that's 100% accurate. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that's 100% accurate. Now, we all know that you have these big fights with other lawyers, and then once the case is over, you shake hands and have a beer. Uh, doesn't sound like that's going to happen in this this case. Um, I, You know, I got to tell you, I, I know with the exception of the judge, I think I knew every lawyer in that courtroom. Um. And I don't, look, I've, I've met some really terrible folks mm -hmm. <laughs> doing this job. I've met some really lawyers that really operate in bad faith. Um, I don't think I, any of those lawyers in that room are, are, dirt, are dirt bags. Um, I think they both, look, we're talking about a case uh, that has to do with the murder of 26 people and someone saying that didn't ever happen. So you got to imagine emotions are running extremely high. Um, but, you know, the no. lawyers didn't get along, nor would I have expected them to. Well, I said, you know, we go to law school and we have these, uh, or some of us have these kind of illustrative um, dreams of, you know, Clarence Darrow and Atticus Finch and uh, people like that. And that's the note to, to, I don't know the defense lawyer. Never met him until I looked him up when I saw his name just to see what his background was. And I, and I to be fair, don't either. I, I've come across him a handful of times, known people that worked with him. Who knows? Yeah, so at face value, my, my thing is, I mean, that's, I don't know him, don't know what his motivations are, but my gut response is everyone deserves a lawyer and that's kind of a, a high calling to represent who what appears to be a not very liked person. Um, and knowing full well that you're going to be identified with that person. And, and now these days, like in every news story that comes out. So I got to give him credit without knowing him. I got to at least 
on my on my little chart where I'm kind of charting what impresses me or not. That that part impresses me if that's where he came at it. You know, I could I a hundred percent understand what you're saying. Uh, at the same time, you know, I feel that way about criminal lawyers. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Because the 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 coercive power of the state is massive. And everyone deserves the opportunity to have an attorney that will hold the state to their burden because you will lose your life, your liberty. Um, and if and if they start chipping away at the people that don't have any power to hire good lawyers, sure. then that subjects everyone to a lower standard than what's in the Constitution. That's right. However, this was a civil case. Right. And... If you are representing any party in what you know will be a high-profile case, especially a villain in a high-profile case, you've got to, um, I think you've got to do some soul-searching. Am I doing what I believe is right and moral uh, in accordance with whatever I believe to be right and moral? Uh, and if you get over that hurdle, you got to say, am I going to make enough money uh, so that if this case goes south and my life is forever associated with this goofball, am I okay with it? I've represented plaintiffs where I've had to tell the jury, hey, my biggest concern is that you're not going to give my client a fair shake because my client's not a very likable person. That's just the reality. Um, I would, however, in this case, add In my personal opinion, Alex Jones is somewhat significantly beyond unlikable. <laughs> he's he's uh, I think he is he's not uh, not somebody that I would represent. Well, maybe we can have that lawyer come in on our show and he can tell us where he's coming from. So, I, you know, I tell you, I've invited the lawyers from uh, Fair and Ball to come on. I've got a reasonable expectation that they will. Um, and I am absolutely going to invite uh, the lawyers for Mr. Jones because however it pans out, good or bad, um, the lawyers that rep well, the lawyer that represented uh, Mr. Jones is going to have a, and this must have been a fascinating, if painful experience. Yeah. And I would, I'd love, I'd love to hear his side of it. Uh, so I'll, I'll absolutely extend that invitation. Well, so tomorrow will be punitives. We'll come back on our uh, later show and discuss that. Yeah. Um, but thanks, God, for that report from the field. Can I, I can submit my, my bills for travel and my uh, hotel stay at the W to the dirty verdict for reimbursement. Is that, is that fair? Yes. The accountant um, is, is standing by Excellent. waiting. Uh, so I'm going to, I'll get those over to accounting you, and, and HR. It was under the hotel room was under 79.95, right? It was the standard rate ah. uh, through AAA, Good. and that's been approved by the adjuster. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks for that report from the field. And with that, we'll end this segment and on to the next one. So this is what we like to call the potpourri round, or if we were playing Jeopardy, they would call it potent potables. Peter, knowing that I really am not very smart and only practice in a very narrow area of the law, he has done a bunch of research uh, on some interesting cases. He's just going to roll the ball out and uh, see if I have any knowledge about what's going on and can comment in a coherent fashion. Well, I have a little more free time, nature of my practice, sure. uh, than, than you do. And so that's why I like to keep apprised of what's going on out there in the world, uh, legal world. And the, one of the goals of the Dirty Verdict podcast is to take some of this news and go a little deeper than you may see in a short news story or in print or uh, on your local TV. Uh, so this one, this this may hit a little home with you, Kyle. Oh, oh it, man. It, it did with me. Okay. Uh, there's a proposed class action lawsuit filed, I believe in New York, against Popeye's chicken. Well, this is a class action against Popeye's. Yes. Dismi Pop dismissed with prejudice. Popeye's, yes. Uh, well known for a revival for their chicken sandwich, which... I think I think that was maybe COVID around there where that was a showstopper. It was the Rubik's Cube or the Teletubby or the what I, was it? I Cabbage actually Patch Kid. I oh. need to confess my bias. When that sandwich came out, I drove down to the Popeyes at like six ten in Richmond and uh went in and bought like 
one of every, they had like hot, mild and medium. Mm. And I bought like one of each for all of my employees. I spent like 150 bucks on sandwiches. Are you sure you did that? Or did you take them out and resell them in, uh, on eBay? That's an ugly thing to say, Peter. Okay, good. Uh, you didn't. You sure? <laughs> You're not under oath. Come on, it's fine. <laughs> Bring, hold on. I've got to ask our staff. Could we get, could we get some Popeyes? That's a good idea. All right. Well, tell me about uh, this. Hold class on, action. hold on. So the lawsuit claims that their chicken tenders are not made from actual chicken tenderloin. The loin, which apparently is not actually the loin of the chicken. It's part of the breast. That's this tender under part of the breast. Uh, whereas other chicken purveyors, they use the tender loin. Well, you know, this takes me back to what Mark Twain once said. There are lies, damn lies, and chicken tenderloins. That's true. Um, I just made quote that it. Up. I was going to say trademark it right now. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, my daughters are, are going to hear that joke and are going to they're going to make that face at me, that dad joke face. I'm sure it'll be subject to some TikToks and yeah, such. So that's the lawsuit. Um, so we will we will monitor this very important lawsuit. What do they see. allege is the damage they've that they've been deceiving that Mr. Popeye has been deceiving consumers? They paid more. They they, paid more they for were loin. paying for some loin and they didn't get no loin. They got it just chicken tender, which is part of the chicken it's chicken breast, which, like, like I said, I wasn't counting on getting a loin. I'd gladly take it if that's what was offered. But when that is you, chicken tender. When you tenders. order a Wagyu burger, do you expect it to be made out of real Wagyu? Because my guess is it's probably not. I would I would think. Of course, I would not know the first thing about what the difference is. I don't. I don't. I can't imagine there is. I mean, most of this stuff, when you buy a chicken tender, it's you should be more focused on the quality of the shortening they're using to fry it with because that's mostly yeah. what you're eating so that's my thought is if you are going to popeyes uh looking for fine cuts of meat you are perhaps uh, in the wrong business well stay tuned for a coupon for five cents off your next <laughs> uh tenderloin order the attorneys your settlement the attorneys associated with this claim have pocketed 25 million dollars but we will give you 13 cents off of your next uh, Popeyes and probably have to get a 16 piece to yes, yeah, like, that's what I meant. Really like the family, generate. the family style. Okay, well, like I said, we'll we will update our loyal listeners on this very, very important case. I, I would like, I'm going to add that to my uh, like, like my Twitter alarm so I, I make sure you know, yeah, I got it. You yeah, that's 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 hard hitting stuff. Well, so based on your purchase history, um, you may be a lead plaintiff, yeah. At some point. <laughs> Ah, All it. right, so we'll move on. Next topic. Lay it on me. Okay, uh, this is late July. Collin County, North Texas, known as one of the more conservative counties in the state of Texas. Is that west? Is that between? North of Dallas. Say north of Dallas. So probably all of the worst things you can imagine about Texas. Depending on your perspective. Very good. Um, is that where Rockwall is? No, Rockwall is east of Dallas. I don't know what the towns are that are up there, but I know, oh, well, Plano. Oh, Plano. Plano. Yeah. So this involved, which I don't know. I make no judgment. I actually, I actually like Dallas, mm. even though it would, up, well, I know growing up in Houston and uh, we had that rivalry, but I, I, my, one of my sons lives there now and um, I'm not a Dallas hater. Sure. Uh, but Collin County known as a uh, very conservative, like, Sure. Probably the most conservative, I bet, if you ran some of the numbers. Uh, in that county, a uh, barbecue restaurant called Focus Barbecue, according to the press story, um, served, overserved uh, some teenagers um, alcohol. And they became intoxicated. They got in a car. They um, had a horrible accident. All three died. The jury uh, in Plano or Collin County awarded $15 million to the families of those young men. Uh, it sounds like this may have been one of those restaurants that we all identified when we were 15 and 16. And that is where they take the McLovin ID from Hawaii uh, or any others like your library card that didn't even have your birth date. Um, no, there's several, like I passed several of them that I 
went to when I was in high school uh, <laughs> on our way here. So uh, takeaways. Takeaways from that, Kyle. Was it, hold on. So three kids died. Yep. 15 million per kid? I believe it was 15 total was the, was the verdict. Uh, so I assume 5 million per. Seems low. One of the largest verdicts in Collin County history. Move out of Collin County. Yep. Unless you want to run a really unsafe uh, bar, in yep. which case that's where you should move. No telling what the insurance was. Um, so if, if and how much the families will recover, um, obviously they won't have their children back, which is the most important thing. Uh, okay, so takeaways. This is a dram shop is what we hear at dram shop. That's, yep. a, that's a law term. Um, it, I don't really know where it originated from. If I were a really good host, I would have researched it and told how the how the the pubs and isn't old so. England. Hold on, hold on. Isn't like a glass of scotch called a dram? Well, you know better than me. I don't know. That's it, because you you drink uh, clear booze, which is for women and people from Dallas only, which makes sense, Peter. Excellent. Well, I this bo- is just club soda. I don't know. So I don't know All right. Know. Well, so I've got a little bit of cream soda here. Good. which is just IBC cream soda. Yeah, that's great. But if this were filled with scotch, I believe you could call this a dram. And so maybe where they sell drams would be a bar, which would be a dram shop, shop. but it would probably be way back then, it would be a shop a S-H-O-P-P-E, so dram oh, shop. Right. Ye old. Ye old dram shop a yeah. uh, Okay. But I think that's where the term comes from, but I'll look that up in my Black's English we'll, dictionary. We'll, yeah, we'll get that figured out. They, but... So the concept is if a bar or restaurant that serves alcohol serves someone who is, I think the term of art is obviously intoxicated. Right. Uh, and then lets them leave, then they face liability for what may happen to that person. For sure. Uh, it's, it, there's a statute in Texas that it, that it takes the place of any other, I think, common law causes of action. Um, there's certain defenses to the owner, operator, if their servers are TABC certified, they enjoy certain additional defenses and protections, but they're still not off the hook totally. Do, do you know how that law accounts for serving someone under age? Does that change the, the analysis? I believe I'd have to look at that from a commercial standpoint. On the social host liability, like if you had people over mm-hmm. at your house, there is a, I believe you're um, immune completely if person you're serving is over 21 it may be 18 i'd have to double check that but there's a different there's a tweak on the law whether you're just an individual non-professional serving alcohol to oh yeah, people yeah. I versus you. I, but I know for a fact that if we're all you have a bunch of friends over your house and they get drunk and go do something you're not on the hook for it okay good i mean you can get sued you've met some of my friends yeah yeah so so yeah that's one takeaway we we, we want to do takeaways all the time okay um the and obviously, this is not legal advice and not intended to be relied upon for legal advice. If you're turning to this show for legal advice, call me for some real life advice. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, so in the grand kind of the analysis of dram shop cases, there's first party and third party. So first party would, I'm sure there's a different term of it. That's how I look at it. The person that consumes the alcohol is the person that also gets hurt, which is effectively this one. Uh, I think in the from the plaintiff lawyer standpoint, the better case is just the regular Joe that's just driving down the road and some drunk person who was overserved hits them. Those are considered very strong cases most of the time. Um, so a couple of things though, I think takeaways. If yep. you're a bar owner, a restaurant owner, get insurance. Um, I think I would, I've never run one of those, but I'm sure your insurance company probably has some best practices that they insist you follow as a condition of providing insurance. One would hope so. Follow those, get your people to ABC certified, uh, and actually not just check the box, but actually do some active training. Uh, and then if you're a family member who loses someone in this situation, some people may gut response, go, well, that was their fault. They, they drank, um, not always the case. So Probably consult with someone like Kyle. Happy to chat. Who will not only tell you if you have a viable claim, but can also tell you uh, the origins of the term dream shop. So do you think, what do you think? Five million bucks for a dead kid? Um, You know, it goes back to what we were talking about on the Alex Jones verdict segment. I think 
those it is so hard to tell the numbers on a yeah. death and it really depends on the 12 people that are in the box on how they view money how they view um how it's presented um by the lawyers just so many variables um, let, let me ask this this is kind of a factual question that I'm, I'm embarrassed that i don't know I, I think i know the answer to it you can operate a bar or restaurant that serves booze without insurance. Like you can get a liquor license and not carry insurance. Is that, do, you, do you know if that's true? I'm not aware of that. No. Um, We're going to put our, our research staff on top of that. Because yeah. I've actually sued a couple of restaurants. Um, one was a dram shop case. Uh, it, was a, it was a bad security and a dram shop case kind of all rolled into one that I made zero dollars on. Uh, because they had no coverage at all. And um, I thought I did, this was years ago. I thought I did some research and figured out that you can, you can serve booze in Texas, but not um, you don't carry insurance. insurance, which leads to the obvious question, which is how many members of the legislature own bars? I bet, I bet that's the answer to the question. How many members of the legislature own bars or restaurants? You, I mean, yeah, you would think that that, cause they hold some power and that they, the state issues a license to sell alcohol yeah. and, um, or sell a dram. Yeah. Or yeah. At a yield dram shoppy. Yep. Uh, but the, um, uh, I've had that come up, I think in cases where there's not insurance, um, on a, on a similar situation, the, but they hold the power. I mean, you have to get liability insurance, even though it's very modest, but at least you have to get something as a condition to be issued a license to drive a car. Right. So that, yeah, that's a good point. That should be, Kyle, maybe you should run for office. I can't imagine I'd be elected in this or any other jurisdiction, which is a testament to democracy. $7,200 a year is the pay for a state rep. Does that change your mind? Let me explain to you my thoughts on public office. And I'm only going to say this once. Mark Twain once said, in America, anybody could be president. It's one of the hazards of citizenship. Well taken, well taken. Okay, with that, we've given our takeaways. Um, we'll be back with a definitive answer on some of the questions raised by Kyle. Probably not. Next topic, Kyle. Lay it on me. Dallas, Texas. You've expressed your uh, maybe skepticism for my affinity for Dallas, but there's the one weekend a year. I'm going to Dallas. I'm getting a funnel cake. I'm getting about 17 beers in a wax cup and about three or four corn dogs. Other than that, I don't know that, it, that America or Western civilization has much use for Dallas. Well, based on some of the stories we're seeing, Dallas may be called the Florida's Texas. Because yeah, that makes a lot of sense. This one, or Texas is Florida, sorry. Right, right. Uh, this story, again, was uh, recent, uh, last couple weeks. Uh, Dallas, title, Dallas Taco Bell manager poured scalding water on customers over incorrect order. Well, well hold on. Taco Bell got the, the order wrong? Yes. And then they assaulted their company, com yes. their their patrons with hot water? No telling. They, if they have chicken, if, if they don't have tenderloin in their chicken, we're going we're gonna to really be upset about that. I mean, uh, um, so this, this one's interesting in that uh, noted national civil rights attorney, Ben Crump, is one of the lawyers for the plaintiffs in that case. Um. What is the civil rights angle on Taco Bell? And I say this not in jest. I'm genuinely interested. I don't believe they're asserting any civil rights causes of action under the statute. <clears throat> I believe they're just saying negligence, gross negligence, and you know, negligent retention, hiring, training, that kind of thing. Chalupa negligence. Uh, well, I mean, is it negligent to order a chalupa? Taco Bell. I, I'm not sure if that's a protected right. We're going to have to get Samuel Alito in here. Yeah. Is, I mean, that may be, uh, that's just not a smart move um, to order it. Um, so apparently this manager did not like these customers. Sure. And um, they had they had a disagreement. Of course, we don't get the details on what time of day it is. Or, or <laughs> if, let me say if, night. If, if you are at a Taco Bell before 10 p.m., you need to... You've got some life choices that you need to reconsider. There's a high likelihood that this was uh, the late night uh, edition of Fourth Taco meal? Bell. Fourth yeah. meal. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was a lady and a minor child, and the 
uh, allegedly, according to the suit, the restaurant manager uh, came from behind a counter with a scalding bucket of water and poured it on the woman in the minor. Um, Taco Bell, of course, gave a statement. We're, we're sorry it happened. But it's not <laughs> our fault. Something along those lines. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. Um, the, there's so many ways I could go with this. Yeah. I mean, what, let's, let's start legal. Okay. So Kyle, from your perspective is the, okay. Most, I don't know. Most of, um, restaurants, fast food are owned by franchisees. Sure. So one, um, suing Taco Bell corporate, I assume they're going to say that's not, well, first of all, they're going to say we're not, you can't sue us in Texas because we're based in whatever state they're in. And, you know, I assume they were based in Mexico. I mean, that is true. Yeah. Could be. Actually, I don't think so. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe they're based in Dallas. There's a lot of corporate headquarters. That actually would not um, surprise me. In Dallas. But assuming that um, you've got that issue, franchisee. But it, the second issue is, are they on the hook? If you have an employee that does something that is not in the course and scope of employment, meaning they don't hire them to scald their customers with boiling water. Uh, all right. If it's a manager, they are a vice principal. And you are on the hook for everything they do. There's a case out there called like GTE Southwestern versus Jack and Jill. I don't remember. Uh, where like a uh, somebody went nuts and assaulted a fellow employee. So if it's a vice principal, they're definitely on the hook. And that's a, in a restaurant context, that's a manager a manager level or up. If it's just a uh, some random, you know, your fry cook, uh, I thought there was a statute out there that said that you're not liable for the criminal acts of your weird employees. However, that then takes you back into this negligent training, negligent retention. And if there is anything on this employee's record whereby some manager said, hey, you know, Sally Sue or Jimmy Joe has a little bit of a temper Maybe they shouldn't be working the front register. My guess is they're going to be liable for it. That said, if you're Taco Bell, um, you know, I'd make a run for the border, grab some cash, and see if you can pay these folks off. Um, that's a terrible pun. But it makes me sad because there's a spot in my heart for Taco Bell uh, for the most part. There's a Taco Bell right across the street from my house. And... I have to say this, those folks at the Taco Bell drive through or the walk-up, they put up with some stuff. They've seen some things. True. They've got that thousand-yard stare, and um, I, I recall going to the taco, my local Taco Bell mm -hmm. um, one afternoon, not at 10 o'clock at night, and... I got very frustrated with the young lady who was at the window because I couldn't hear her. And I kept yelling uh, because I, I couldn't hear her and she couldn't hear me. And I could see her name tag. It was like Lindsay. And I, and I yelled. I said, I said, Lindsay, this is ridiculous. I can't hear you. And she leaned out of the window and she said, it was not my idea to put this Taco Bell next to a truck-sized car wash. But here we are. Well, I, I have to say I like Lindsay. And I was like, like you're dropping some, some truth on me, Lindsay. Yeah. And I was like, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry for yelling at you. And a lot better to get truth than a bucket of scalding water. But if you could get a bucket of tacos <laughs> along with that universal truth, who's going to complain about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For 59 cents. I mean, it's a... Taco Bell is the best deal, bang for your buck, I think, in, in the food business. Tell me, what does the petition say about damages? Uh, I don't have a copy of the petition. Um, I do know a couple more facts, and that is, so the manager got him once, and then he came, He, I assume it's a he, because I think there's some reference to that. The manager doubled down and went back and got another bucket and came at him again. And well, they dodged hold on, so let me make sure I understand. The person throwing the bucket was a manager. That's, yeah. Taco Bell's hosed. Well, when you said... Meat when you, hosed. When you when you drop that uh, that knowledge about manager, I, I took note because the article 
talks about, probably says the word manager 10 times, yeah. which suggests to me that the petition says manager yep. more than that. Oh, yeah. And so, and obviously, whoever, you know, Ben Crump's a smart guy, and I'm sure who he's partnered with are smart. They they probably also knew what you said about what, that. What state is it in? Texas, Dallas. Yeah, so black letter law, if you are the manager of a restaurant, you are a vice principal. Got it. And the... Uh, the 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 owner the owning entity whether franchisee or corporate um, is a hundred percent on the hook for your bad acts. Yeah. Okay. And then they can, as we talked about on that charter, that seven billion dollar death verdict, also in Dallas. Um, that was the issue. Is remember the employee came back to a cable company employee came back to the house and ended up murdering a lady. Right. I've actually read a few things about that case since. Not okay. not that we need to rehash it, but. Uh, it, it, the facts that I've seen developed about that case mm -hmm. uh, seems like that cable company did literally everything wrong. Right, it, it on, should, hiring, on hiring yeah. and managing. And Looks like they had multiple opportunities to get this guy uh, out uh, of the position where he could harm the public, and they neglected to, to make really any effort. So that case, we know the facts because it was tried, so it was fully discovered. This case is at its... Uh, beginning stages. So that will be the issue for attorney Crump uh, to develop a higher, I mean, among other things, develop uh, if they were negligent in hiring this guy or if there were other, something tells me that someone doesn't. I, I, I think my, my point is the negligent hiring retention and training goes out the window. Well, you get it on top of the other stuff. You might get that on top, but you don't need it. Yeah. He is he is the voice and actor on behalf of the corporation because he is their vice principal. It's as though he's an owner. I think it yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> I think it would be good, helpful, because I think a jury in oh, their yeah. mind could go, you know what, that's not their fault that this guy lost it. Sure. But I, generally people that throw scalding water on children, or at least you know, minors, I don't know how old the minor was. Are single, people uh, without kids. Yeah. <laughs> if you've had no, kids, you're, you're, if you are a parent and someone says, we threw scolding hot water on a kid, you're like, I get it. Yeah, it happens. It happens. Uh, no, so that, something tells me there may be some some documentation you in the file. You think? Uh, for me, there are probably people that work for that manager. My guess is uh, setting up the depositions of his subordinates will be happening shortly. And Ben Crump, if, if you need some help litigating this case uh, and need some basic ideas about litigation, I'm happy to discuss that with you. But deposing his subordinates is probably a great place to start. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Takeaways. I'll say, I'll, I'll drop this one. And you alluded to this. Remember that people that work at the Taco Bells of the world... Um, Deserve your respect. Yeah, be nice. And your kindness. Yes, they're in patience. Most of all, patience. Because let me take a step back. Of all the things that are scolding hot that you could have thrown on you at a Taco Bell, water might be the least offensive. True. Yeah, we've seen, I mean, we could probably do 10 hours of stories on that. But yeah, don't be nice to them and be patient with them because you're afraid they're going to throw scalding water on them. Be a on decent you. human. Just be a good human being and understand that, you know what, they're probably not... They, that's probably not the job that they're striving for in life, but that's for whatever reason, that's where they are then. So be patient, take a deep breath. Maybe you got extra Look, cheese I, and you shouldn't have. Just, let, let me say this. In my personal Taco Bell experience, I don't even check the bag anymore. Yeah, it's a surprise. It's part of the fun. It's, it's a lottery. Yeah. And I don't want to make that Taco Bell worker suffer the indignity of me explaining that they did their job wrong. Because... They care as much about that job as I care as much about me eating food at that point. So I should be able to live whatever the consequences are of, of me getting in that Taco Bell driveway. And so, I, like I said, I want their commitment to serving me food to be commensurate with my concern about food. And if I get what I get, that's fine. Look, my deal is I'll take whatever they give me as long as they don't spit or put anything in it other than what's dictated by Taco Bell's menu policy. That's all. <laughs> if I get that, I'm happy. Do your best, Taco Bell. Yeah. Okay. And um, and obviously, takeaway is, uh, again, we've talked about this before. If you run a company, I know it's hard hiring people, especially now, but do the, do the background check, do the training, document stuff. If you need to terminate someone because they have some problems, do it. 
Um, I know that's easy, easy for some lawyers to say, but that's why lawyers like Kyle are unfortunately still in business because people do things that cause real bad injury to people. I tell people all the time, they say, ask me what I do. And I tell them I'm a personal injury plaintiff's lawyer doing trial work. And they say, oh man, I hate lawyers. And I usually say something like, if the majority of Americans would simply act more mature than your typical fourth grader, I'd be out of a job in six months. Yeah. Or drive like a fourth grader would drive. Like that's just aspire to that. Fair enough. Uh, uh, as, as we, every day is a, New day on the roads. Okay, so those are the takeaways on the Taco Bell scalding incident. And we'll can we close. get this? Can we get the staff to just put in a like a, a boom? Oh, you get a yeah Taco Bell. Ding, we need, we need a Taco Bell gong. We're going to do a different bell sound than our uh, standard. Yeah. Topic change. Yeah, it'll be a Taco Bell gong. All right, we'll go. We'll go to our next topic, Kyle. Um, and that it, this is a local. Now this is a Houston story. Lay it on me. All right. Um, this is a recent story. Houston doctor suspended for vaccine misinformation files $25 million defamation lawsuit against Methodist Hospital. Tell me this person's name. Um, should we just keep keep names out of it for right now? Uh, Unless you need to like check your conflicts before you... That's my point. Okay, this is in the news. Her name is Dr. Mary Bowden. Don't know anything about her. Okay. Wait a minute. I, I mean, I've heard her name because it's. I think I might have. I might have cheated, Peter. I think that I. I think I might have. Did you read some of the stories? I think I. I think I, in passing, might have read an article. She was at Methodist. She was saying some kind of nutty stuff about the vaccines, and then they asked her politely to stop several times, uh -huh. and then they canned her. Yeah. Does that sound right? I don't know if she was fired. Yeah, publicly ousted her. Yeah. So I. She lost. She. I don't know that she was like in the hospital i think maybe she had rights at the facility or maybe maybe that's wrong do you, do you are you able to tell she, um i don't know because i've never really understood the whole credentialing and uh privileges thing okay that um, makes sense because you're really let's well see informed. yeah of course um you know as much about med mal as i do about dram shop yeah. yes that's very little although i have lots of friends that know it well and, and some very good Med mail lawyers. Let's see. So in November, the hospital announced on Twitter that Bowden's hospital privileges were suspended. There you go. For spreading dangerous misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines. Yep. Which were harmful to the community. True. Um, as a result, she resigned, filed a lawsuit. I guess it was kind of a rule 202 or for, for people not in the inside baseball, that's a, you file a petition asking for information without necessarily suing anyone. Right. Yet you say you intend to probably sue, but you intend to prosecute, but you got to get some information without so, suing. Yeah. So, um, so anyhow, so now she has, uh, filed a lawsuit in Harris County state court, asserting defamation claims, um, against Methodists. I'm not sure we did. We don't, obviously, if we were real on it, we would maybe read the petition and could you tell me what court they're in? They, um, let's see. It appears, Cause let's put, go ahead. Um, one eighty ninth, which I believe is judge Scott Dollinger, but will be a new judge right. come, uh, January. All right. Um, so, uh, okay. So first of all, you've, we've had, a long discussion about your field trip to watch the Alex Jones defamation True. trial. Now, you probably have this experience as a plaintiff lawyer that gets a lot of calls. I, in my day, um, at a firm that had a lot of calls, we would get a, quite a few defamation sure. lawsuits, of which we took zero of them. Yep. How about yourself? Have I ever taken a defamation case? Yes. Filed one. That's a good question. Um, I don't think I have. If I have, I don't recall it. The reason why is it is a few a few of them. One, the slap law, anti slap law, sure, uh, which was actually pretty much written for defamation, has been extended well beyond uh, its intent. I believe. I agree with that. It has now been kind of maybe tailored back a little bit, but that was the whole. I think the reason for the law, which is. Um, if you're going to accuse someone of defamation, then you better have evidence of it. True. And, um, which I fundamentally don't disagree with. And, um, and so 
slap law says that they can file a motion to dismiss, and then you've, if it applies, you got to come forth with evidence. Okay, that's one thing, which is smart in her case. She did a 202, which I said the pre-suit investigation thing to go get, maybe that was their intent, to go get some information to protect them. I know for a fact, because I've had to litigate this, slap the Houston appellate courts say that slap the slap law does not apply um, to a 202, a pre-suit. Also, um, investigative yeah. lawsuit petition. Other other um, districts, appellate districts, do find that it does. So probably in Collin County. Yeah, I, no Corpus is one. Oh, for instance, uh, would not have guessed that. Yeah, uh, at least the last time I looked at it. So you file a defamation lawsuit. You have to have your ducks in a row. One, two, your damages. What are your damages? Um, well, anguish? for her. Well, I mean, in her case, she's going to say that her. Limiting her license. I mean, limiting her ability to practice. Uh, uh, that's going to be, that's, I think that probably the best part about her lawsuit is damages. My guess is the rest of it's nonsense. Yeah. But well, I, she I bet the damages are realistic. Yeah. And that, that's interesting because there'd be an interplay. I mean, if you have, because I don't know if they Wait, have. Did our, she resign or she get canned? She resigned. Well, but she says because. She resigned because she felt sad about not being able to lie to people about COVID. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it was um, – they published false and defamatory statements to the press on social media, affording no due process. Um, so I'm not – yeah, that's her. So she – Who's her lawyer? Um, it was someone I'm not familiar with. I'm sure very – let's see. It's a 19-page petition, so we can always uh, go read it if we're, like, really on the ball. If we were doing our jobs. The lawyer is uh, – Madhu Sekaran and Stephen Biss from, well, Charlotte, Stephen Biss is from Charlottesville. Madhu is from uh, Cyprus is the address listed on the deal. Okay. Um, so that will be an Do interesting. Do they work for some like reactionary GOP think tank? Um, I don't, you know, just you, you look at um, the fellow from Virginia and that would be your kind of gut, gut thought is that it's right. some type of, uh, you know, public interest law firm. Right. Um, but anyhow, so let's let's do the takeaways. Kyle, if you think you have a defamation lawsuit and you're an individual, sure. What, what is that something you should probably do, or is it something you should maybe think think about? Well, that's. I mean, it just depends on the facts of the case. Um, let's say someone got online and said Kyle Herbert is a crappy lawyer. Fair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Kyle Herbert is the worst dram shop lawyer in Houston. Kyle Herbert doesn't do dram shop law, so maybe fair. Yeah. So I, I can l l let me say this. All joking aside, I have on occasion gotten calls, mostly from old high school friends, because mm -hmm. uh, I grew up just down the road in Friendswood, uh, and it almost always has to do with fights amongst people and or parents who otherwise would not get along under any circumstances with anyone. I mean, these are usually people looking to pick a fight over nothing. That is not to say that there are not legitimate dram shop cases, not dram shop cases, not to say that there are not legitimate defamation cases. There certainly are. Mm -hmm. Like the, the case that just was awarded right. 4.1 million bucks. Right. That's a decent chunk of change. Right. Um, I think this case in particular, this doctor has an incredibly uphill battle for two reasons. Uh, well, let me say for one reason in her case, and that reason is um, truth is a defense. And if this hospital, uh, which hospital is it? Methodist. Methodist got real good lawyers. They do. I've dealt with Methodist before. Yeah. Uh, I've sued Methodist. Mm -hmm. And my guess is Methodist is going to show up the day of trial and in discovery with a whole bunch of um, epidemiological studies about what happens to people in hospitals that have COVID. Yep. And mm -hmm. there is no way that she's going to be able to refute that with a straight face. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm looking more at the story. So she, apparently according to the Houston Chronicle story, she had suggested and then walked back a claim that Methodist was not treating unvaccinated patients. So, you know, they may have some claim against her. That's the other thing on defamation. There's a, in the law, there's a uh, 
provision where you have to ask the person to retract and if they retract appropriately then i think it minimizes your liability in some way maybe on the gross or punitives you may know more than i do i i don't not in that regard but i do know this the, the two biggest hurdles hurdles usually for a defamation case are one that truth is a defense mm-hmm. and two what are your damages yeah that's what i was saying so if somebody if somebody instant messages you peter and says you're a dirt bag and a bad lawyer and a liar. Kyle told me. That's yep. not been broadcast to the community. No. Um, and so the, the typical communications amongst people, normal humans, go about their business every day. Like you just don't have any damage. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this is another one we will follow. Um, uh, but yeah, so the takeaway is, as you said, think really hard. For you, if you really want to do that, if you're a lawyer, think really hard about whether you want to take that case. I mean, I believe so thoroughly in the veracity and usefulness of most defamation cases that if you've got a great defamation case, don't call me, call Peter Taft. <laughs> yeah. And I'll refer you to a defamation lawyer. The, uh, the, and the other takeaway is just try not to defame people. And then you, no one has to worry about that. Just be nice. Yeah. Just like, like, just do what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Probably just don't comment or send texts after you've had some drinks. I, I'd never do that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, then I think we, we're all, we don't, we won't have that problem. If, if, I, if I have cocktails, I turn my phone off, except to the extent that I can access Uber. So, very, very smart. There you go. All right. Well, we'll close the book on that topic and we'll move on to our next one. Thanks for joining us this week at the Dirty Verdict Podcast. For links to some of the stories discussed today, please visit our website, www.dirtyverdict.com. If you have obtained a recent verdict and want us to discuss it, please email details on the verdict to us. Also, please follow us wherever you get your podcast.